Hello and welcome to this week's Why Football podcast with me, Etches Adoku and Michael Dryden. Dryden, how are you doing? I've been better. Um, and first, firstly, hello, Etches, but I've been better. Um, I've recently moved flat and I've got 12 meg of internet promised by Sky. <laughs> That's the most I can get. So FIFA 21 has came out. It came yeah. out very recently. I like playing FIFA 21. Probably Do you? Not, I'm probably not going to be able to play it online with my friends and pro clubs because... I've got 12 meg of internet. How bad is that? So your, your internet's gone back to 2002 then? It has, yeah, absolutely. Although the most exciting thing about FIFA coming out is not the game, it's not the players, it's not the ratings. It's when those kids get caught having spent about three grand on Ultimate Team. I know it's in the paper like mum has or their mother has like reported a scam and the yeah. kid's looking there really guilty. <laughs> Just standing there looking like he knows the truth. <laughs> but she's reported it because she thinks it's a scam and he's got away with murder. But I bet he's got a good team though. I've, uh, I've got a friend who I won't mention the name of who actually spent a lot of money on Ultimate Team and uh, actually called his bank up and claimed he got scammed as well. That's. Uh... I won't mention his name. <laughs> <laughs> it actually happened. I found that the other day as well. Well, he he, like, as like he tried to get his money back, and he knew and that he, he did, spent he, it, and he did get his money back. He spent it himself. Oh, what well, am I try it? <laughs> <laughs> so how are you, Rich? Yeah, I'm good. Uh, not much to report. Uh, standard week of work. Um, I'm looking forward to doing some stuff on the on the weekends. Um, but I do have to address um, one of my good friends, Niall, um, massive or big Palace fan. Noticed that you made a small error error on a pod. Okay, okay. You referred to Spironi as the uh, Julian Spironi as a trouser-wearing uh, Palace legend when it's, in fact, Gabor Corrali. Mm, I apologise for that error, Niall, yeah, and all right. the listeners out there who are disgusted by that error. But Spironi did wear a tracksuit, did, did wear tracksuit bottoms, didn't he, at some stage? Digging a hole, mate. I tried to find a photo after you told me, and I couldn't find one. But I swear Spironi did wear tracksuit bottoms. Either way, they're wrong. Shouldn't be worn. Digging a hole there, mate. <laughs> Apart from that, um, yeah, so recently in the City game, I mentioned about maybe 10 episodes ago that I have the same barber as Ivan Pavetta. Mm-hmm. He played his first Premier League game against Manchester City, um, didn't do a great deal, but his lid was looking as sharp as mine. Oh, really? So 10 out of 10, basically. Oh, right. Uh, that's all I had Brilliant. to say. That's all I had to say. Yeah, good. Thanks for that. Thanks for the update. Keep us a, 10 episodes of time. Give us another update. No worries. We'll, we'll do. We'll, uh, yeah, thanks. This week, Dryden will be telling us all about the late and great Howard Kendall, his career as a player and a manager, his Everton success, and we'll discuss whether Everton can return to those heights. Before we start, please follow us on Twitter at whitefootball underscore for our latest content. Please follow and subscribe with us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Acast for immediate access to our future episodes. So Dryden, why this topic in particular? So I'm sure... Everyone will know that Everton currently are flying in the Premier League under Carlo Ancelotti. They've won the opening four games, scoring 12 goals, which is impressive. Um, They very much were a team to watch out for going into this season. Um, They added the likes of James Rodriguez, Alan and Decore, for example. Um, So I think everyone was very intrigued as to how those players would perform, um, but also sceptical of whether that group would gel right away. They weren't great last season. They finished twelfth, um, so I think there was a bit of a scepticism as to whether they would co- they would they would basically perform from the get go. Um, Calvert Lewin um, has been leading the line. Another one that was seen as a perhaps a gamble for a lot of for a lot of people that he would be able to provide the sort of return that would just kind of propel Everton to where they want to be is towards the European spots. Um, but obviously that's all irrelevant now because they're doing very well. Calvert Lewin has been fantastic. Score for England recently against Wales. Um, he's got six goals and he's leading the Premier League charts. Under Moyes, they were consistently in that top eight bracket, achieving a handful of fifth place finishes and one fourth place. So they'll be hoping to get back to that to that level. Yeah, on um, the piece on Calvert Lewin, uh, actually under Marcus Silva, he didn't believe he had the quality and they really wanted to get in. I believe Milik was the target but Marcel mm. Brands who is I believe the director of football really backed him and now um, you know he's reaping the rewards uh, they have had a great start to this season um, and I'm really interested to see how they fare up against Liverpool which is their next game because their Merseyside record has been so poor mm. uh, their last win was in 2010 and uh, you know it, it'll be a really fascinating tie especially with uh, Liverpool after getting dispatched 
seven two. Yeah, I think a lot of people think that um, Calvert Lewin came through the academy, but he was actually signed from Sheffield United for one point five million a few seasons ago, or four or five years ago. Um, which is interesting because I think a lot of people did think he came through as a as an Everton youth prospect, but actually he was signed. And when he was signed, probably people were scratching their heads, but now he's came through. Um, so, yeah, so to answer your question, Eches, of why I picked this topic, given Everton's flying start and amid the international break, we've got no Premier League. I thought I'd take us back to the 1980s um, and that Everton side, the successes under the late great Howard Kendall. Um, that period we hear referenced so often, but. It's perhaps an era that I don't think too many people know a great deal about, um, including myself prior to researching for this podcast. Um, so that's why I'm choosing the topic. Yeah, you're not wrong. You know, I've always been aware Everton had that successful period, but I don't have too much information actually on it. So who actually is Howard Kendall? So Kendall was born in Wrighton in the northeast of England in 1946. As a player, he made um, 613 career appearances. It's quite a lot in the Football League between 1963 and 1981. Most notably, he was at Everton as a player, where he made 229 of those appearances. Prior to joining Everton, he started his career at Preston North End, becoming the youngest player to play at Wembley in a final at the time, at 17 years old, um, and so many days. Originally a defender, Kendall was moved into midfield upon joining Everton, um, becoming one of the so-called Holy Trinity alongside World Cup winner Alan Ball and Colin Harvey. They formed the base of that side that won the 1970 First Division division title for Everton. There's now actually a statue outside Goodison Park, actually, of those three, the Holy Trinity. He went on to captain Everton, but they couldn't build on that title win in the coming seasons, um, with their next title coming under Kendall's reign as manager in the following decade. He went on to play for Birmingham after his uh, time at Everton and then Stoke and Blackburn before returning to Everton and retiring in 1981. Kendall is regarded as one of the best players never to play for England. I suppose he came through as a player at a time when they won the World Cup. As a player, Kendall's play was said to be understated and economical and he was not renowned for his goals output. He was only 5 foot 7 as well, quite a short guy. Um, Kendall's management career spanned around 20 years. He began as a player manager at Blackburn in 1979 before joining Everton in 1981 again as a player manager, which is interesting. You don't see that too often these days, particularly in the, pre- in the first division of the Premier League. After his success at Everton, which we'll go on to, he went to Athletic Bilbao in Spain, leading the club to fourth in his first season and qualification to the UEFA Cup before being sacked the following season after a poor start to that campaign. He was linked at that time with a move to Newcastle United and Manchester United, but returned to England to manage Manchester City in 1989, securing their first division status. He was linked with the England job following Bobby Robson's departure, but allegedly declined an interview. Interesting. Um, He went on to have two more spells at Everton as a manager, either side of stints at Greek side Xanthi, Notts County and Sheffield United. He returned to Greece for his final job in management at Ethnikos Piraeus. And a great pronunciation again, I think I just gave myself a pat on the back. He remains the last <laughs> English manager to win a European competition with an English club, which is an interesting statistic, um, and was inducted into the English Football Hall of Fame in 2005. Kendall sadly died in October 2015, aged 69. Yeah, solid pronunciation there. Thank you. I'd probably give you three gold stars. Oh, I think I'd say three out of ten. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, yeah, that record on Howard Kendall uh, being one of the youngest players uh, at the time to play in a cup final. was If it was the FA Cup final. Yeah, so it was. The, uh, FA Cup final. Uh, that, that record has since been broken. Mm. Who by? Theo Walcott. Wrong. You're thinking about the Carling Cup final. That's not that one. Hector Bellerin? No. James Milner? No. <laughs> Just tell me, please. Put me out of misery. In 2004, it was broken by Curtis Weston of Millwall. I've never heard of that player. Neither. I googled it when you were talking about the uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, moving on. Uh, also, as well, in America, like the Hall of Fame is like a massive thing. Yeah. Um, like, as you know, they have these massive speeches and all these people are there. The English Hall of Fame is just not really like spoken about. Like, you don't really know who's in it or who's inducted in it. I'm sure there's, you know, some of the great biggest names are there, but it doesn't have the same sort of fanfare or publicity. No, I mean, the American games, typically, like a lot of the sports, they have they have the All-Star Games, yeah. like the Hall of Fame is a massive deal. I mean, when Michael Jordan got inducted to the Hall of Fame in basketball, mm. so, you know, I'm a massive basketball fan. Um, he, it was a massive deal, wasn't it? There was a big crowd there, ex-players, Scotty Pippen, um, Dennis Rodman, mm. all the boys. Um, it was a huge deal, but in England, you wouldn't have that. I don't know if there was a ceremony for him or Howard Kendall getting the Hall of Fame award or mm. any of his counterparts. Note that um, Dryden just named three of the big players from um, The Last Dance and uh, that's as far as his bicycle knowledge goes. <laughs> so Dryden, thanks for letting us know that you've watched the series. Appreciate it. So tell us a bit more about his success as Everton manager. So as I mentioned earlier, Kendall returned to Everton in 1981, formerly a player, following a brief stint as player manager at Blackburn Rovers. He only made another four appearances as a player when he joined as player manager before hanging up his boots to focus on the management side. And probably is wise because player managers typically never seem to work out. Kevin Nolan, not currently being a, a good example. Upon arriving as manager, Kendall signed goalkeeper Neville, Neville Southall from Bury, who everyone will know very well. He went on to spend 17 years at the club, wow. which is pretty impressive. He also brought in then youngsters Trevor Stephen and fellow Hall of Famer and ex Sunderland manager Peter Reid. Um, they finished seventh and eighth in his first two campaigns as Everton manager. In the 83 84 season, Kendall was actually on the verge of being sacked by Everton. So, some parallels with uh, Alex Ferguson, perhaps, in terms of that start. Winning only six of his first 21 league games in that campaign, which is not a lot of games to win. Certainly not. Um, thankfully for Kendall, their fortunes turned drastically and they went on to reach the League Cup final, uh, losing 1 0 to Liverpool in a replay. And they went on to win that season's FA Cup, beating Wofford 2 0 at Wembley. Um, and a finish in the league was seventh place, which is pretty modest. The turnaround was helped in no small part by the £250,000 signing of Andy Gray in November. Although, to be fair, the Scott only actually netted 14 times for Everton in his two seasons. I think he made just over 50 appearances. I assumed it would be more, given he's quite revered by Everton mm. fans for his time there. But I think he's got quite a lot of big goals, particularly mm. the goal in the uh, Cup Winners' Cup final, which I come on to mention. Yeah, I've got two points there. One, um, congratulations again for mentioning Sunderland on a pod even though there's no real link <laughs> but thank you for letting very me know. vague link there. yeah very vague <laughs> link um second point is you know Andy Gray was the first man to win player of the year and young player of the year in the same season did so at Villa mm. um I love winning that one off um it was a bit of football trivia. I don't think they should win do you think they should be able to win both because if you are if you win the player of the season mm. and you're within the bracket for being the young player Mm. at the age bracket for being young player of the, of the year as well mm. and in theory you'd have to win both so I don't think they should be I think they should be separated out in terms of not in terms of age but if you win the first one you shouldn't then be able to win the second because yeah. in theory you should win both but it kind of defeats the point of the second one if speak to the PFA mate <laughs> that's all I can really say to you on that one okay I will just, do just going to speak to them um, finally as well on um some, uh, that uh, that title win, so not title win, sorry, when they survived relegation, what was it six wins out of 21 league games, mm. which is a pretty terrible statistic. How many did Lund get uh, in their worst Premier League finish? You mean Sunderland? Sunderland, yeah. Well, we, we got 15, 15, 16 points. You know how many points they got? Uh, I'm going to say th two wins. Was it actually two wins? I don't know. Oh, I, thought I thought you had it up on your screen. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. I've sort of deleted that from the memory bank, really. <laughs> Uh, that was terrible. We got beat 4-1 by Newcastle. That was the first derby I ever went to. As like a, I don't know, I think I was about eight or nine years old, a bit a bit older. We lost four, we went 1-0 up through a Justin Hoylett goal from a Arsenal player. Yeah. And we lost 4-1. Shearer scored a penalty. There's nothing worse than seeing Shearer score against Sunderland and his arm raised in the air and he run towards Sunderland fans. So moving on to the 84-85 season, this saw Kendall and Everton build on the cup success of the season prior. Um, they won the first division by amassing 90 points, 13 points clear of local rivals. Liverpool, they really were 
it really was a period of Merseyside dominance in the 80s. I think it's a theme that will come out of this. The end of that season, plus 45 goal difference, so it really was a dominant year. Scottish striker Graham Sharp um, was their top scorer um, with 21 goals. So, as I said, it wasn't Andy Gray, who yeah. was typically the goal scorer, but perhaps he had more of a uh, crafting kind of um, influence on the team. Everton lost to United 1-0 in the FA Cup final to prevent them completing the double. Peter Reid picked up that season's PFA Player of the Year award, former Sunderland manager. And Neville Southall won the Football Writers Association Footballer of the Year award. So we spoke in the intro about, you know, making mistakes and errors. Uh, mm. So so <laughs> Justin Hoylet uh, doesn't actually exist as a player. I realised that as soon as I said you, it. You've merged together QPR's junior Hoylet <laughs> and former Sunderland and Arsenal player Legend. Justin Hoyt. Mm. So I think nice. we need to clear that one up Justin now. Justin Hoyt was the player that scored. We lost yeah. 4-1. Okay. Worst day of my life. Okay, good. Just to make sure. Actually, the worst day of my life when we lost 5-1. I went to my first ever game at St. James's Park as an away supporter. But we'll just we'll we'll move on. From yeah, that. I think we need to <laughs> Dra- dragging on the mood in the room a little bit. Um, but that must have felt really good for Everton winning the league. But not just that, but crushing your arch rivals in the process. Uh, mm. I had no idea Peter Reid uh, actually won PFA Player of the Year. I didn't know he was specifically that talented. But mm. Clearly, he was. Yeah, he's a legend of the club. I didn't realize he was in the Hall of Fame. Well, likewise, like mm. you, I, I knew he was a good player and was famous for his time at Everton during that period. But I didn't realize he was actually renowned as one of the. I don't know, one of the, the greats to get into a Hall of Fame mm. category. Yeah, exactly. In that 84-85 season, Everton were taking part in the European Cup Winners' Cup as a result of winning the previous season's FA Cup. In that competition, they breezed past Inter Bratislava and Fortuna Cityard in the opening stages to then set up a semi-final clash with Bayern Munich. After a goalless draw in Munich in the first leg, Everton ran out 3-1 winners in a second leg clash regarded as one of the greatest games ever seen at Goodison Park. In the final, Everton steamrolled Rapid VM 3-1 in Rotterdam from goals from Andy Gray, Sharp and Kevin Sheedy. Moving on to the 85-86 season, it was very much a season that lacked silverware for the Toffees. Gray was sold to Villa prior to the season and despite signing Lineker who chipped in with 30 league goals that campaign, Everton finished second place behind arch rivals Liverpool who also beat them 3-1 in the FA Cup final. Yeah, I believe... uh... Gary Lineker was actually the top scorer that year and he actually won football's writer of the year as well, I'm pretty sure. So yeah, thirty goals is a big is a big feat. I think mm. Henri got thirty goals once, Kevin Phillips did as well, former Southern striker. <laughs> In the eighty six, eighty seven season, and despite Lineker departing for Barcelona, Everton reclaimed their title and um, finishing nine points clear of rivals Liverpool again. However, they could not compete in Europe at that time, um, as many people would know, due to the Eng- to the ban on English teams in Europe after the 1985 Heysel disaster. Um, this ban allegedly frustrated Kendall and was cited as a major factor for his move away from England to Athletic Bilbao in 1987. A number of English players followed suit um, and are said to have moved abroad at this time due to the ban, including Lineker, obviously moving to Barcelona, as I said. Kendall returned to Everton in 1990, signing the largely successful Peter Beardsley. After a string of mid-table finishes, however, he resigned in December 1993. He did return again in 1997, but resigned at the end of the season after only just avoiding relegation on the last day of the season. Yeah, it never really works when managers return. You know, you had King Kenny at Liverpool... And he signed Suarez, who is a fantastic player, mm. but also signed Carroll and didn't really bring back the good times. Yeah. Um, you know, Leandro Jardim at Monaco, I think he left, he brought in Henri, and then Jardim came back and didn't do very well, got sacked. So I never really feel like when these big managers that have such successful periods return, you know, it, it never really reaches those heights ever again. Yeah, Keegan came out to Newcastle and didn't do very well. You also had Mourinho come back to Chelsea and win the league, but then he faltered. So I'll agree. True, true, would, true. That true. Would fit. But yeah, I agree. It's always kind of a, it's a match made in heaven, but can often ruin that match as well, ruin that relationship. True. So uh, how else is Kendall remembered? Does he have any sort of statues or chants? So Kendall is not only remembered for his success with Everton. Well, actually, he does have a statue, actually, as I mentioned, if you listen to the podcast, uh, Etches, he's got a statue outside of Goodison Park with the uh, Holy Trinity. 
Um, <laughs> but not only is he remembered for his successes with Everton on the pitch and as a manager, he's widely remembered for his infectious personality, his good humour and his approach to things generally off the pitch. I thought this is a good thing to mention. He died sadly in, in 2015 at the age of 69 and he's just right, widely regarded as being a very good person with a brilliant approach to life. Um, the story, such as before an FA Cup tie away to Stoke, he allegedly opened the dressing room windows to allow the travelling Everton fans to come through and engage with the players, stating, that's your team talk today, don't let those fans down, which is an interesting managerial tactic. Mm. Um, and at that time, actually, in that, the price of that game, Everton weren't doing too well. Mm. So the fans had came down and obviously they needed some kind of uplift. Um, so to do that could actually, you know, when the team's not doing too well, could be quite, you know, could be quite dangerous to do in terms of like if someone was to give them loads of abuse or you never know what could happen. There's another tale relating to the sign of Dave Watson from Norwich um, two days before the start of the 86-87 season. Um, the formalities were not quite complete on the deal, but Kendall noticed a clock on the wall, turned the hand, hands back an hour and had a photograph taken with the smiling Watson um, the Football League seemingly accepted it and he's made his debut the following Saturday. Um, that would obviously not be something that could happen today. <laughs> um, but at that time, you know, technology wasn't as advanced and that clock on the wall really was uh, really was the uh, the gospel. So we've talked a lot about how Kendall, and we touched on Everton briefly at the start of the podcast in terms of how they're doing now under Ancelotti. So finally, you can just touch on, do you, can, can Everton return to the big time? We often ask these quite um, broad questions at the discussion point at the end of our podcasts. They are unique and arguably different to other teams that have risen in the Premier League. You could talk about Leicester and we talk about Wolves perhaps in that same bracket. They've both got wealthy owners. Um, Wolves are owned by Fosun. But Everton really do have some serious wealth behind them. Um, so there could be a question. You could say with the right team, they seemingly have got their team right and are building. Ancelotti is a brilliant manager. He's not getting any younger, but he's got a lot of success behind him in his career. And they actually do have the wealth behind them as well to actually potentially penetrate that elite. We've talked at loads of times on the podcast about how that is such a saturated elite now. There's only there's only four Champions League spots. There's only two or three Europa League spots. So how can you penetrate an elite when there's not enough space there? We talked about it in the context of the Champions League as well, but actually if you've got that wealth behind you, there's always a chance. And um, with, with Everton actually seemingly building now positively, previously they hadn't, they'd signed players like um, Torsen up top, for example, who were expensive flops. They brought in Walcott, they brought in Bernard, these players that haven't done so well. The signings this season under Ancelotti are positive and perhaps they're going in the right direction. Yeah, I think... When we say, can they return to the big time? The question is, what do we define that as? Mm, very true. I think if we were to say, can Everton replicate the success of the 80s, you know, winning leagues and FA Cups, mm. I maybe would lean towards FA Cup success and League Cup success. I think there's a gap in the big six. So we'll call Arsenal, we'll throw Arsenal in that category where for them to breach the top six is doable with the squad they have. And I think that would be yep. a success for them. If we were to say, oh, can they reach the top two? I think the gap is too large and I don't think they'll ever be able to close that gap significantly because I still see, even though City have faltered so far, I still see them as a step ahead of the Chelsea's, United, the Arsenal's and the Tottenham's. So can Everton return to the big time? I believe they can crack European football. Uh, I believe they can do well in cup competitions with the manager and the squad that they do have and the resources. Can they replicate the success of the 80s? I don't think so. Yeah, and can they draw that real elite? I mean, elite of players... Liverpool, for a period, as we know, under Dark Leash, you referenced it earlier, weren't great at all. They had Charlie Adam in centre midfield mm. alongside players like Joe Allen. I think Joe Allen did okay at Liverpool. They had Carroll up front. They had actually quite an average team. However, because their history is so much more extensive and there's a draw there for the elite to come and play at Anfield, play for Liverpool, when they actually built and they spent money on their team and they invested with Fenway Sports coming in, with Klopp eventually coming in, they could do so more rapidly and the, the calibre of player they could bring in is so much better. You know, Everton have acquired players like James Rodriguez is an excellent player, but the only reason they've managed to bring in James Rodriguez is because he was faltering elsewhere. If he was doing very well elsewhere, like Salah was doing at Rome, at Roma, for example, like Marnie was doing at Southampton, they couldn't buy that player because 
the other elite in that league, as we've talked about, would also be in for those players and would probably outbid them. Mm. So it's not just about the place in the league is their places there. It's also about you're competing with these play these teams for players. Yeah, and if sure. you've got seven of the team, uh, seven of the players, seven of the teams, sorry, in the in the league who are vying for those players and have the resources that match you or better, then that's very difficult. But I think compared to perhaps another team that's sort of glowed up in the league, you look at Sheffield United, they did really well last season. I know it might be that first season kind of um that first season kind of thrust towards the top of the league that went very well for them, but we've seen in the second season they're not doing so well. But if for them to sustain that level they did last season, I think they finished eighth mm. without resources behind them, without bringing players in and competing with the, play- the teams that are at that level for those players. It's just impossible. It is impossible. But also as well with that Liverpool side um, that you just mentioned, they did have Stuart Downing. So you said they were lacking <laughs> quality. Um, Downing was there. Well, actually last season, he was the highest assisting defender in the championship. And his first season at Liverpool, he recorded no goals and no assists in the Premier League. All right. Cheers, guys. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs> He did. You, you mentioned you had a highlight reel where it was just a black skin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's very rude. Yeah, he was good at, he was good at Middlesbrough, um, but he was just one of those players that never really lived up to the to the hype. No, he did not. That's all from us. Thank you for tuning into this week's Why Football podcast, and we'll catch you next week. Cheers, guys. See you next week. 